welcome to First Financial Biz Beat, presented by the Business Courier. I'm Kyla Woods. The coronavirus has stifled air travel, but not all of it. On this week's front page centerpiece, cargo is king at CVG. While business travelers stayed home, cargo has exploded. The airport set new records for tons of cargo in April and May, making it the main business happening at CVG. DHL, one of the two main cargo tenants, the other being Amazon, had double-digit revenue growth in April. And the thought is that a shift toward online shopping could be permanent, meaning the growth will continue. CBG CEO Candace McGraw started at the airport the same time DHL came to Hebron in 2009. She talked about cargo's explosive growth with Courier reporter Chris Wetterick. Thanks for here, uh, being with us, Candace. Um, appreciate that. Uh, give me a little bit of uh, historical perspective on cargo at CBG. You know, every airport has at least some cargo coming in. But how long, you know, how long has, has growing it been a focus for CBG and, and why? Uh, sure. Thanks, Chris. So cargo has been a key component of CBG for quite a while now. Um, you know, when I came into this role about 10 years or so ago, that was coming off the heels of our dehubbing from a passenger carrier, and we knew we needed to diversify our business. So we, you know, dug into our strategic plan and said, all right, how do we best diversify our business? And at the time, uh, we went deep into cargo, and it's proved to be a great strategy for us. So from about, I'd say, 2015 through 2019, I know we were the fastest growing cargo airport in the U.S., perhaps North America. And over that time, we've grown cargo about 55%. So it's been a huge focus of ours, and, you know, it's, it's reaped a lot of benefits for us. Great, great. What, uh, what in particular makes CVG a good airport for cargo? Well, you know, in all things, right, what do they say in real estate? Location, location, location. So first and foremost, we are, you know, ideally situated in the nation where you can reach about 60% of the country within an hour's flight time, right? We're situated ideally for DHL, um, so they can reach anywhere in the world via an overnight flight. And they have, you know, about 55 or more flights a night out of here to all places all over the globe. So first and foremost, location. Uh, and then I'd say we have a great airfield infrastructure. We have four runways that can operate, uh, three of which can operate independently. So, you know, for cargo carriers, it's all um, speed and accuracy and no delays and being able to time up flights. And because we're so well laid out, it works well. You know, I think I've relayed to you perhaps the anecdote in the past when we negotiated out the Amazon deal and, um, you know, we finally got to a deal closure and it was clear that they had been talking to some other airports early on. I said, all right, now what are those things? Why did you finally choose CVG? And what they said was, first and foremost, we had a great airfield infrastructure. Two, we were surrounded by a great highway infrastructure. Three, we had a great depth of talent with aviation experience. And fourth, uh, my airport team, we could move at the speed of business to get a deal done. So that was, right. that was the perspective. And, and DHL likes the, the fact that the runways, uh, you know, if you have crosswinds going one direction, you just use a different airway. Exactly. Right. I'll tell you, you know, the, the uh, people that were here before us, right, did a wonderful job of laying out the runway. Um, so efficient. Um, so operationally sound, and um, it's it's worked really well for us. And DHL has been a great business partner. Um, as you know, there are number we are their number two location in the world in terms of volume. Ninety two percent of any of the DHL packages that fly anywhere in the Americas comes through our airport every night. So it's a it's a you know great benefit for this region, and they're good good folks to work with. Let's talk about COVID-19 for, for a second. Uh, how important is cargo going to be to you and to the airport as we recover from COVID-19? Yeah, cargo has been um, a mainstay for us, a blessing for this airport throughout this pandemic. Um, you know, while the passenger flights were down, of course, and they're, they're starting to rebound, thankfully, but cargo has operated um, at holiday levels throughout this whole um, last several months. In fact, you know, we had another record month in May where we were up 16, 3% year over year, and that was yet a new record. So we continue, continually set new records. You know, um, and I also think during the pandemic, uh, people got used to buying things online, right? We, I, I'm saying CVG has now become the epicenter of e-commerce, and I think that will only 
bode well into the future. And kind of the final benefit that maybe folks don't consider is um, having that stable level of operation allows us to keep our fees and charges low for the passenger carriers as well. So as those passenger carriers are thinking about what routes to uh, layer which airports to look at, you know, it, uh, having that good cargo base allows us to have a very reasonable and low fee structure for the passenger carriers as well. Great, great. And then lastly, what what is CVG's strategies on leveraging your real estate and growing cargo? How do those talk a little bit about how those intersect? Yeah, thanks. So, you know, as I said, 10 years ago, right, we had all our eggs in one basket and they were, it was a great basket, but you should never have um, everything, you know, tied up in, in one strategy. So we looked at what things we had, right? We had cargo that we were able to diversify into and we also had land. So we're fortunate to have under our control here 7,700 acres the bulk of which is for um, airfield, but we also had um, parcels of land that could be developed. We said, all right, if we, if we want to go deep into cargo, then we should look at those businesses to co-locate, um, you know, at or near CVG that are going to help uh, facilitate and keep that cargo engine stoked. So um, huge win for us. We've developed probably 300 acres for non-aviation development over the last several years. And again, during this pandemic, thankfully all those people have paid their rent checks and we've had uh, had uh, income coming in. And I think, you know, for a long-term strategy for this region, um, um, supply chain and cargo will be critical, right? Between Wilmington to the north of us, UPS to the south of us, this corridor will get you um, and get your goods anywhere in the world without delay. So huge, huge um, emphasis on supply chain and cargo moving forward. Well, Candace, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we appreciate your time. Always. Thank you. Kyla, back to you. Thank you, Chris. Well, things got intense at the second public hearing on Cincinnati's budget. Protesters started booing, shouting, and walking towards city council members after someone spoke out in favor of fully funding the police department. Budget and Finance Committee Chairman David Mann closed the hearing and left with a police escort. The hearing resumed without him. The budget proposal includes a bump in funding for the police department. A third hearing is scheduled for Monday. In the meantime, the man in charge of crafting that budget is leaving. Patrick Duhaney is taking the same job in Virginia Beach. He's worked here for more than a decade, serving as city manager for the last year and a half. Duhaney says his childhood played a big role in this decision. I think it's the, the chance and opportunity to see if I could do this well someplace else. You know, um, it's also... I was born and raised in Kingston, Jamaica, so the ocean tends to call me, you know, so that plays a role into it as well. City solicitor Paula Boggs Muthing will be the interim city manager. She's the second woman and the first Asian American to have the job. Ohio is asking the federal government for help with unemployment. Governor Mike DeWine is requesting $3 billion to pay out claims. The state has paid out around $1.5 billion in claims so far. The last time Ohio had to borrow this much was during the recession. Good news is that at least at this moment, uh, there is no interest being charged by the federal government. Uh, so that is a that's a happy thought, and that we're able to 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 borrow this money. Obviously, we would, you know, I, I think the best way to describe it, Andy, is that we've got a long-term structural problem. Governor DeWine says that kind of problem is easier to address when the economy is rolling. Well, TriHealth is eliminating uh, 440 positions. At least 150 are open positions that will not be filled. Some employees will be reassigned or retrained. And though it's operating at about 95% capacity, that 5% reduction in operation is costly. TriHealth lost $100 million between March and May. Hilltop is moving out of Cincinnati and taking with it 20 high paying jobs and a $3 million investment. The family owned supplier of construction materials is setting up shop in one of Covington's River Center Towers. President Kevin Sheehan says the move makes sense economically. Plus, he says they can look across the river at the landmarks the concrete has gone into. The company's concrete facility next to Paul Brown Stadium will also be moving as part of an agreement to build a mu music venue at the banks. That location has not been picked. 
The United Way of Greater Cincinnati is giving more than half a million dollars to projects led by black entrepreneurs. The 29 projects include the Cincinnati Music Accelerator, Cozy Home Learning Center, and the Q Kids Dance Team. The grants come from the Black Empowerment Works Program created by the United Way's Champions of Change. Far too many black families in our region are experiencing poverty and far too few black led ideas and by extension leaders receive funding to address those issues. The programs will also be connected with mentors, volunteers and training to help the grassroots initiatives grow. Well, up next on First Financial Bisbee, what will be America's largest indoor sports complex is taking shape in Hamilton. We'll get our first peek inside. It's now official, the Western and Southern Open will be played in New York this August. Safety is the big reason why. Organizers want players in the same place as the U.S. Open instead of traveling across the country. So it's headed to the Big Apple and going with it tens of millions of dollars for the local economy. Organizers expect to be back in Mason next year. The Open's top executive is leaving too. Andre Silva is now the tournament director for the PGA Tours Players Championship. Butler County, on the other hand, is gearing up for what could be an explosive economic engine. We're getting our first look inside the under construction Spooky Nook Sports Complex in Hamilton. The 40 acre facility is on the site of the former Champion Paper Mill. Once finished next December, it will be the largest of its kind in North America and the crown jewel of Hamilton's revitalization with an expected economic impact of $144 million. As businesses slowly start to recover from the coronavirus pandemic, the stock market is rapidly recovering. First Financial's Chris Hagedorn talked about that surge with Courier Market Engagement Director Kelly Snyder. Thanks, Kyla. Well, Chris, thanks for being here again. I know we talked a few weeks ago and um, just a couple things have changed, right? So a um, couple questions. First of all, what's drawn your attention as an investor in the current backdrop? Yeah, so what we've written about uh, most recently is what we're calling minding the gap. And no, we're not talking about the London Underground here, but as you can see in the chart, we're really referencing a widening negative earnings growth gap that's opened up for the balance of 2020. So you can see that in the yellow bars uh, pointed downward. You know, that's obviously been a consequence of, of COVID and a, and a shutdown of economies worldwide. And I think it's also created a, a tremendous amount of uh, downside volatility uh, for markets in uh, February and March. What's interesting is investors haven't seemed to mind nearly as much in April and May with the S&P 500 recovering about three quarters of those losses. And, you know, this is coming at a time when the fundamentals candidly have been pretty awful um, up until mo more recently where we, we just started to see some early signs of, of improvement there. So if the fundamentals are so bad, why has the market rallied over the past couple of months? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think a question on a lot of people's minds. And, and what we would say is um, really until most recently, it's been less about the fundamentals and more about what we would call liquidity and sentiment factors. So you know, what are those? Um, well, liquidity is effectively the ease with which a company can, can do business without being under duress. And I think the policy response we got out of both Washington and the Fed has created a tremendous positive liquidity backdrop. And then sentiment is how investors feel about certain securities. It's often reflected in what they're willing to pay for them. So what we're showing you in, in this chart are uh, two measures that we track in each one of those three categories. So just by way of explanation, you know, the average percentile reading is how a metric scores on a, on a range of zero to 100 relative to history. So a low percentile reading would be, you know, well below average and vice versa. And then the momentum reading is the percentage of, of metrics that have shown improvement over the prior month. So the point we're trying to make here is if you look at the bars on the fundamental side, you know, they're much lower than the bars on the liquidity and sentiment side. Now, the caveat here is, when we've started to see um, signs of the fundamentals begin to catch up. And it's not to say that the fundamentals are great by any stretch, but they're getting less bad, so to speak. So I think beyond that initial relative improvement that we're seeing now, I think the question will come back to, 
you know, what's the ultimate shape of the recovery look like uh, in terms of how fast can we get back to normal? So what does this mean for investor portfolios? Yeah, so what, what should we be doing right now? And I think um, what I'm going to say is probably going to sound uh, unsatisfying to some, but it's truly how we feel right now. And, and that is, frankly, we don't think it's time to be uber bullish or bearish, given how uncertain the backdrop is and how there could be a number of different scenarios that could be yet to play out. What I mean by that is, if we do, in fact, get a quick V-shaped recovery and things get back to normal quickly, then the improvement in the sentiment measures I was talking about earlier will be correct in anticipating an eventual improvement in the fundamentals. If, on the other hand, we get a second wave of the illness, if the recovery is more prolonged and drawn out than expected, or if political risks begin to ramp up, then one could certainly argue for the opposite. So point here is we think it's a time to almost overemphasize diversification. And as a result of that, we've got a lot of underlying hedges uh, within the portfolio. So as you look at the table here, point is there are pockets of our positioning that, that are leaning more aggressive. There, there are pockets of our positioning that are leaning a bit more defensive. And that's deliberate in really trying to maintain that broad diversification. Well, that makes sense. Well, again, Chris, thanks for being on. We look forward to hearing um, how things are going in the next uh, couple of weeks. So um, again, we appreciate your being on. So Kyla, back to you. Thank you so much, Kelly and Chris. Well, still to come on First Financial Bizbeat, the head of the YWCA joins us to talk about reimagining its biggest fundraiser of the year. And we'll take you inside the reimagined Japs in OTR. and restaurants closed by COVID-19 reopened last month, but one of Cincinnati's most well-known decided to wait. Japs owner Molly Wellman played it safe, waiting to open until this past week. And things are different at the OTR staple. You have to make a reservation, and when you get there, the bar is off limits. The bar stools are replaced with majestic palms. Even the way you order is different. You order off a specially curated menu, and from your phone, and you actually pay from your phone as well. So that order goes to the bar, the bartender brings it on a silver platter to your table. So it's kind of a neat experience, different but neat. You can reserve any one of the nine socially distanced tables for a maximum of two hours. And it's still not clear when and how music venues will reopen. Musicians are ready to play, but maintaining social distancing in a business built on putting as many people possible together in a building is tough. So the business models are changing, but those running them say they will survive. And the time off has given them a chance to reevaluate how they will do things when they do reopen. And uh, I think we have the opportunity to also consider how we incorporate uh, the voices of people of color and and, um, and and give them a platform once we are again able to operate uh, it, strangely enough comes at a good time when uh, we are dormant and looking to rebuild and uh, now we have an opportunity to reimagine and the coronavirus has also brought the YWCA's biggest fundraiser to a halt. So they pivoted. And here to talk about the creative edition of the Career Women of Achievement Award is Barbara Perez, the YWCA's president and CEO. So great to see you, Barbara. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. And so, of course, the YWCA Career Women of Achievement event is always a highly anticipated gathering. And you made the decision to pivot and broadcast the event this week. So what were some of the biggest takeaways from such an innovative approach? You know, we had so much fun doing this production last night. And thank you to Channel 12 for being a partner with us on it. But we knew, you know, we knew a, couple, a month or so ago that even though we had rescheduled the event to October, that it wasn't going to be possible to have 2,000, 2000 of our closest friends in one room. Uh, so we decided to do this production. One of our board members had the brilliant idea. And so it was really quite fun putting it together. Our, our co-chairs, uh, Dr. Lakshmi Samarco and Debbie Hayes, 
uh, helped us pull it together. Our Bright Light production crew did a lot of work for us. And so, you know, what's so important is that we needed to tell the story of our mission. So our mission to eliminate racism, empower women, and promote peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all is being tested like never before in the current environment that we're living in. Yes, it is, and that's a perfect segue into the next uh, topic I wanted to discuss. So, of course, YWCA does such incredible work in our community, and with everything going on right now in the fight for racial justice, uh, are, have there been any new programs or new efforts or kind of more reimagination born out of this current movement? Well, you know, today we're celebrating, or celebrate is probably not the right word, we're honoring Juneteenth. And so we've made a statement, uh, a public statement, to um, declare racism as a public health crisis. And we are trying to work with the county. Um, Commissioner Victoria Parks is working on a resolution for the county, and we are in full support of that effort um, and hope that, that we're going to be able to make that happen in the next few weeks. That is very exciting to hear. Of course, I think we're all excited to see such momentum around the Juneteenth holiday. So thank you for your support in that. And what more can we expect to see over the coming months from YWCA and how can we continue to support? You know, I think what we're concerned about right now is um, the increase in domestic violence. As people have been staying at home and sheltering in place, they've been with their abusers. And um, COVID-19 and all of the anxiety and stress that it brings with it, uh, financial insecurity, uh, loss of control, that's a toxic recipe for domestic violence. So we, we've seen a, a doubling in, a, uh, in our hotline calls. And we think over the weeks ahead, as people are able to get out more, we're gonna see a real demand for our domestic violence services. So we're preparing ourselves to be ready for that. Such important work, Barbara. Thank you so much for your leadership at the YWCA and in our community. And thank you for your time with us today. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Take thank care. You. And thank you so much for joining us for First Financial Biz Beat. I'm Kyla Woods wishing you a happy Juneteenth celebration this weekend, and I hope you have a great weekend.